Here we are in Suffolk on a beautiful spring morning and we are at the Stratishall camp. It's no longer a camp of course, but in 1972 this place was home to up to 2,000 of the Ugandan Asians and they initially came here because it was a holding camp. So they arrived at Stansted Airport, they were put into coaches and the coaches came up this road and they stopped here and they went into that um, office there, into that building where they were initially registered. They were given a hot meal um, in a canteen behind and then they were allocated to their accommodation. Um, this had been an RAF camp and if you look here you can see the memorial uh, between 1938 and 1970 it was the RAF were here um, and obviously it was important in the Second World War. It was vacated in 1970 and so it was open and accessible for the Ugandan Asians uh, to use. Uh, there was accommodation for them all over there, the other side of, of the fence which is now a prison. I was seven and a half years old when I could study stall camp. We came late at night and we, you know, we were taken in, into this building and to do the, all the registration and everything and then they fed us and then they took us all to, to our accommodation. Uh, I think it was just temporary accommodation in the main hall. And then next day they put us into all the houses. It looks you know, all familiar, but it's obviously a bit modern right now. So originally when they first came to the camp, they shared one converted air hanger that had been changed to adapt and um, um, house three different families. So the air hanger that they lived in was separated with just wardrobes, so there wasn't a lot of privacy. Um, single people had, I don't know, I suppose more dormitory type of allocation in the barracks, whatever they had up there at the time in the 70s. Um, and then we had a sort of voucher system for, for um, milk or food or something like that. The first day we went to the canteen to eat, it was just English food and meat and everything. And that was alien to us, you know, we never seen food like that. And it was impossible for any of us to eat that sort of food. So my mum and a few women uh, approached the, uh, the manager of the restaurant, of the canteen. And he says, yeah, that's fine. If uh, you can cook Indian food if you want to. And my mum and a few ladies went to Cambridge to a local Indian shop and they bought all the, all the, masana, all the ingredients needed to make the Indian food, the vagar. And my mum would do that and the six ladies you know, would chop the onions, and, uh, uh, the onion, potatoes, whatever it was needed. And then my mum would make them you know, the food. Uh, so they gave them every day chapatis, rice, sakpat, rotli, what, you know, all the Indian pali basically. And uh, yeah, we got that every day. The colours I remember were amazing, you know, made our sort of traditional English garb look a bit dull and dreary. Um, but it was, the, it was the total culture difference that uh, I remember most. He, um, he got the school together and they started meeting as a school. And on the Friday before, he had three staff, a school, no pupils. On the following Monday, he had a school, three staff, 80 pupils, and the following Friday, five days later, he had a school, three staff, and 1,200 pupils. I don't remember there being any particular guidance on what we should be teaching them, other than giving them a gist of what being in England was like, and, and keeping going the sort of general English and maths Maths particularly because they all seem to be pretty hot at maths. Shock, the weather was a, was a, was a big shock for me. Uh, coming in, in September time and watching the beautiful sun and then you find out it's very misleading. It, it, it isn't sunny and warm out there. It is sunny but it's not warm. Uh, so the first time I managed to get, uh, catch the cold so I had to use the medical services of the Stratish Hall in there. <laughs> but it was that big impression of driving past the base and just seeing so many displaced people yeah. out there with, you know, lost, they looked lost, and they were lost, weren't they, at the end of the day. And yeah, that does, that's, that stayed with me anyhow. And I know it has probably a lot of other people as well. It's something you hope you never see again, but as we all know, the world is moving on and things are happening again. Yes, and I think the, the support we got to, to integrate, the support from 
uh, people our own age and the neighbours was terrific. But let's also be honest that Britain didn't open its arms to us and say, immediately come in, okay? It took public pressure to get them to take us in. So yeah, they did the right thing in the end, but Britain's involvement in Uganda has a dirty history.